how come it's Gunvald who gets to go to South America? Sorry? Who decided Gunvald should be the one to go? Um, it was Malm and the Commissioner. Not you, then? Me? Uh, no. Um, I mean, I did agree that Gunvald was probably the right one. And why did you think that? They speak Spanish. But don't they all speak English? Probably. Because I speak English. Well, obviously him speaking Spanish was what clinched it. Yeah, well, fair enough. But next time, next time, can it be me? Um... I mean, if something like that comes up again, because I really wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind going to a hot country with beautiful women and getting a lot of dinners on an expense account. OK. Well, I'll ask the Commissioner to bear that in mind. Gunvald Larsson had been sent to South America in order to observe a complex security operation. And it was impossible for Martin Beck to tell Einar Run the truth. That he hadn't been sent instead, because the Commissioner considered it inadvisable to send a slightly morose, badly dressed, red-nosed member of the working class. Where are you off to now? I've just got to go and do this thing. What thing? It's just a thing. The year was 1974. The city was Stockholm. And Chief Inspector Martin Beck, head of the murder squad no less, was due in court. What the devil are you doing here? I've been called as a witness. A witness? Yeah. Who by? The defence. Who's the defence? Crasher. Crasher? Yeah. Oh, that's a bloody shame. So what do you know about the case? Not a lot. Then why are you here? Well, Crasher asked me to come. I didn't have a huge amount to do, so... Why, you lot never have much to do. You should come and work for me, then you'd see. I've got 39 cases right now, and now, apparently, I've got to spend all day listening to Crasher go on about social injustice. I guess I haven't got anything else better to do. District Attorney, Bulldozer Olsen, was the judiciary's expert in armed robberies. He was a man with very bad taste in clothes. Today he wore a bright pink shirt and an equally bright yellow tie. Not only this, but the tie was adorned with mermaids and hula hula dancers. The accused was brought in through a small side door. She was very young and had long fair hair. In stark contrast to Bulldozer, she wore a pale blue dress and black clogs. The accused in the case is Rebecca Lind. Are you Rebecca Lind? Yes. May I ask you to speak a little louder? Mm, yes. I'm afraid that counsel Theobald Braxane has been unaccountably delayed. I'm here. I'm here. So we see. Hi. Ah, what have I missed? Not a great deal. Could you put your cigar out, please? My cigar? No, oh, 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 yes, my cigar. So, may we begin? Uh, yes, yes, by all means, begin, begin. Would the counsel for the prosecution now introduce the case? I maintain that uh, Rebecca Lind, on Wednesday the 22nd of May this year, committed armed robbery of the PK Bank in Misomar Kransun, and thereafter was guilty of assaulting a police officer. And what does the accused say? The accused, Roberta Lind... Oh. Rebecca Lind... Rebecca Lind pleads not guilty. And so it is my duty to deny all this drivel. Objection. We haven't started Well, I object yet. anyway. To what? You, using the word, the term, the term dribble. Well, then I object to you persecuting the innocent. This girl's hardly innocent. This girl is as innocent as the carrots in the grass. What? What in God's name of carrots got to do with it? <laughs> Mr. Olson, would you please now state your case? <clears throat> so, uh, Rebecca, shortly before two o'clock on the 22nd of May, you walked into the PK Bank in Misoma Kranzun and went up to one of the cashiers. You were carrying a large shoulder bag which you placed on the counter. You then demanded money and the cashier saw that you were armed with a knife. The cashier set off the police alarm with her foot. Two policemen arrived before you had the chance to get away. And then... Uh, oh... Mr. Olson. Bulldozer found himself slightly distracted by the only spectator in the gallery. She was an attractive woman of about 35. She was making notes, and he wondered who she was and what she was doing here. Yes. Sorry, um, so that then uh, you, Rebecca Lind, uh, offered violent resistance to arrest and... The first witness for the prosecution was bank clerk Kirsten Fransing. When did you first realise that this was a hold-up? Well, as soon as she threw the bag on the counter and demanded money. 
And of course, then I saw the knife. So I handed over the money as quick as I could. And I remember she said, I didn't think it would be this easy. And she almost sort of laughed. And why did you hand the money over? Well, we've had instructions not to offer resistance in situations like this. No more questions. Okay. Has the defence anything to ask? No. I thank you, madam. You may step down. Thank you. And my next witness is Constable Kvastmu. Constable Kvastmu stepped up and laboriously repeated the oath. I please tell us in your own words what happened. Well, she was standing there and Carl didn't Carl, do... Carl, Carl... Uh, Christian, so, my partner. Mm. Uh, he didn't do nothing as usual, so I threw myself on her like a panther. <laughs> a panther? A panther, yes. <laughs> and then I got hold of her right hand, just as she was trying to pull the knife... And then I told her that she was under arrest and that. And then I just had to carry her out to the car and she resisted violently. And then it turns out that one of my shoulder flaps come off and my wife wasn't too happy because she had to sew it. And it turns out she didn't have any blue thread. <laughs> any questions, Mr. Braxton? No questions. Thank you. The court is adjourned. <laughs> Martin Beck used the adjournment to eat sandwiches and drink beer. He was accompanied by the attractive woman who had so distracted Bulldozer Olson. Her name was Rhea Nielsen and she was 39, not 35. She was observing in court all week as part of her new job working for social services. The fact that she was a close friend of Martin Beck was sheer coincidence. Mm. Christ, this trial is depressing. And the prosecutor is a complete buffoon. Yeah. And the way he stared at me, like he'd never seen a woman before. I think his wife just left him. Why did she marry him in the first place? I have no idea. Mm. And the defence lawyer doesn't even know his client's name. Poor girl has no hope. I wouldn't say that. Really? Bulldozer wins most of his cases, but occasionally he does lose. And then it's always the Braxane, or Crusher. Crusher? That's his nickname. <laughs> Christ. The whole case ought to be turned back over to the police. I agree. I mean, nothing's been properly investigated. I agree. God, I hate the police. Well, not all of them. Not you, obviously. I like you. <laughs> but, I mean, they hand their cases over to the prosecutor's office and they aren't even complete. And the prosecutor struts around like a peacock and the people who are supposed to judge are only sitting there because they're no good at anything else. God, it's awful. Mm. You know what? I think Crash is going to do all right. The court reconvened and the case continued. The defence counsel called his first witness, a Mr Bunderson, bank manager. Have you ever met Camilla Lund? Who? Rebecca Lind. Have you ever met Rebecca Lind? Yes. When? About a month ago, the young lady came to the head office of the bank. What did Rebecca Lind want? Someone had told her that banks lend money. And what did you tell her? I told her the banks don't lend money without interest and security. She told me she had a goat and three cats. What did she want the money for? To go to America, she said. But she didn't know whereabouts in America and she didn't have an address. Then she asked if there was a bank that was owned by the people, which ordinary people could go to to get money. I said that the PK Bank was officially owned by the state, so in a manner of speaking, it was owned by the people. Was anything else said? May I remind you, Mr. Bunderson, that you are under oath? Was anything else said? I offered to help her. How? I thought there was a, a way we may be able to help each other. And what way was that? You offered to pay her for sex, is that correct? Yes. And what did Rebecca Lynn say? I don't remember. She told you you were disgusting. I don't remember that. Objection. Yes. What exactly has this got to do with the case? It has everything to do with the case. The next witness called by the defence was Martin Beck. Chief Inspector Beck. You will no doubt remember a man called Philip Mauritson, who 18 months ago was convicted of murder in connection with the armed robbery of a bank. The prosecutor in the case was my, perhaps not all that learned friend here, Mr. Ulsson. I object. Objection overruled. I myself had the thankless task of defending Mauritson, and I would like to ask you a single question. Do you, Chief Inspector Beck, 
Consider that Mauritsen was guilty of the bank robbery and the murder connected with it, and that the investigation presented by the prosecution, Mr. Ulson, was satisfactory from a police point of view? No. No more questions? Well, I would like to ask this. Did you, Chief Inspector Beck, take any part in this investigation? No. Thank you, Inspector. That's all. Martin Beck stepped down and went to sit beside Rhea. I thought there'd be more to it than that. I didn't. Crusher, with his limping walk, went over to the window behind Bulldozer and in the dirty glass wrote the word idiot. Bulldozer remained blissfully unaware of the insult. His next witness was Constable Christianson. According to my information, you've been a policeman for 15 years. Uh uh, yes. Your superior officers consider you lazy and unintelligent, but honest. Objection. Objection. Counsel is insulting the witness. I'm merely pointing out that he is an experienced policeman, as capable and clever as most of the other policemen in our city. <laughs> Madam, spectators are expected to be quiet. Sorry. Were you the first into the bank? No. Did you seize this girl, Rebecca Olson? Lind. Sorry? Rebecca Lind. Uh, Rebecca Lind, indeed. I didn't seize her. No. So? What did you do? I took the baby. A baby? The girl had a baby in a sling. You know the kind of thing I mean. And when Kabasmu seized the girl, I said, do you want me to take the baby? And she said, yeah. Did she say anything else? She said, don't drop her, will you? And I didn't. Would you say that Constable Kabasmu used violence? Yeah. You could say that. Yeah. And did Rebecca offer any resistance? No. Did anyone speak to the cashier? Uh, yes. I did. And what did she say? She said that the girl came up to her and she put her bag down on the counter. And when the girl turned round for a sec, the cashier saw the knife. Did Rebecca take out the knife? No. She had it in her belt. Behind her back. Was it a large knife? No, it was a little kitchen knife. Sort of thing you peel a potato with. Did you happen to see Constable Quasmu's shoulder flap and the torn off button? Yeah. It was like that the day before. Uh, the day before the robbery? Yeah, that's right. I remember because he was moaning about how his wife hadn't sewn it up for him. And that she was a lazy cow. Any questions, Counsel also? No questions, and the prosecution withdraws the charge of assaulting a police officer. <clears throat> The witness may step down. My next the counsel for the defence then turned to the accused herself. Why did you go to the PK Bank on the 22nd of May? Because I wanted to borrow money. You wanted to borrow money? Yes. So, when you went to this bank, you really thought you could borrow money from them? Well, yes. Because the other man, the one who wanted me to have sex with him, well, he said the PK Bank belonged to ordinary people. Mm-hmm. And then when I asked the woman, the woman at the counter, she just started filling up my bag. She didn't even ask me how much I wanted. And I said to her, I said, I didn't think it would be this easy. And she didn't say anything. Then the police arrived and grabbed me. Why did you want the money? To go to America. To find Jim. Who oh, no, that's Jim. He's the father of Camilla. Who's Camilla? My baby girl. So he abandoned you and now you want to follow him? He didn't abandon me. He couldn't get work here. And he thought if he went home he could find a job and then we could go and join him. So what happened then? Well, he was a deserter from the army. But when he contacted the embassy and all that, they, they said that he wouldn't be punished. But since he went, I've heard nothing. Nothing at all. Oh, my dear girl, it sounds very much like he's deserted you. But he wouldn't. Sorry? Jim wouldn't do that. Uh, one more question, Rebecca. Why were you carrying a knife? I always carry a small knife. To slice up fruit or, or vegetables. I don't like my daughter to eat processed food. It's not good for her. It's not good for anyone. And there we have it. The accused genuinely believed she could borrow money in this way. How can a person be so naive, you might ask yourself. Well, Rebecca is clearly not a very worldly young person. But that, in itself, is no crime. And to carry a knife to peel an apple is not a crime either. Soon after this, the judge read out a character appraisal of the accused, 
The appraisal pointed out that Rebecca Lind was an excellent mother and that she had never shown any criminal tendencies. The court's deliberations were quite brief. Rebecca Lind was declared free. Are you going to appeal? <laughs> no, it's not worth it. Not if I have to listen to Crasher go on and on for another bloody day. <laughs> ah, yes, congratulations, Braxton. Yep, the best man won. Ah, oh, very, very gracious of you. Right, well, I must be off. Onward and up. Well, we'll meet again at that. Look, thank you for coming, Morty. That's all right. I thought I understood your train of thought. Oh, well, that's the thing. Plenty of people understand one strain of thought, but hardly anyone will come support it. Hmm. If Bulldozer wants to appeal, he probably wouldn't lose in a higher court. <laughs> but that's the beauty of it. He won't appeal because then he'd lose his precious image of being a man who's so busy he doesn't have time for anything. Mm. <laughs> when they walked into Martin Beck's apartment, Raya said, Oh, you did a good job today. How many policemen of your rank would agree to testify at a trial like that? I don't know. Oh, I bet you're the only one. I'm sure I'm not. Anyway, what you said turned the whole thing around. What have you got in the fridge? Um, I've no idea. Uh, whatever you left the last time you came. I'll have a look. <sighs> We're receiving early reports. Let's go, Rebecca Lynn. In Latin America. What happened to her? Following a bomb explosion. Ah, uh, nothing. She'll be released. The assassination oh, really of <laughs> Thanks. I mean, what will happen to her? Can she look after us that? Sorry, no, hang on. And others in the bulletproof car were killed immediately. An international terrorist organization known as ULAG have claimed responsibility for the bombing. Oh, Christ. In broadcast from France immediately after the assassination. What's wrong? Gunvald Larson's there. Where? In South America. He's there. He's right there, right now. Why? Research. What sort of research? Into security measures. What well, wouldn't you have heard by now if he was hurt? I'm going to ring Kung's Holmes Garden. Okay. Hello? Skacker? Yeah. Has anyone heard from Larson? Yes, yeah, he's okay. Larson? Yeah, he, he was right there, right in here. He's always right in here. <sighs> but he's okay, he's, he's fine. Just really pissed off about his suit. His suit? Yeah, apparently he was wearing a fancy new suit. <sighs> okay, okay. Well, well, thanks, Skaka. I'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Oh, thank God. I mean, if we'd lost Larson, I don't know what I'd do. I thought you didn't like him. But I do. Does he know that? No. Well, you should tell him. Tell him I like him? Yeah. Hmm, I think that'd sound a bit strange, don't you? <coughs> Maybe. Oh, it's nice to get those shoes off. Just take everything else off if you want to, I mean, if you feel like it. Okay. <coughs> Ooh, that was quick. I'm very efficient. You are. What about you? Me? Get undressed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. You are slow. Later, he fell asleep with his face against her shoulder. Her shoulder grew numb, then her arm. But she didn't move. She just lay in the dark, liking him. Well, Larson, there's no need to tell you how pleased we are that you escaped from that terrible business without injury. Mm, what seems slightly odd is that you stayed there for 11 days after the assassination. Yes. What happened to you? I had a new suit made. A new suit? Well, if you want the job done properly, it takes time. <laughs> how am I supposed to be able to explain that to the auditors? Well, just tell them what I told you. I really don't see how we can justify that in our accounts. Anyway, since I had to wait around, I tried to find out what had happened. Well, we already have their report. Yeah, well, personally, I think the security service made at least two major errors. Mm, nothing in the report. Well, sod the bloody report. I was there. I was right there. And I can tell you now that they made mistakes. In that case, we don't want to repeat them. If indeed there were. Jesus, Mom. All right. So, the senator arrives in November. Uh, November 21st. What do we need to do? We need to get our act together. And how do you propose we do that? Back. 
What? We should get Beck to organise the whole shebang. Really? Yeah. Because he's clever. Well, there are other policemen who are equally clever. <laughs> yeah? Like you. All right. So, we clearly need a meeting with you, Malm, Beck and Muller. Muller? Oh, but oh. he is the head of security. <laughs> Eric Muller arrived at the conference room late, red-faced and sweating. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry I'm late. Where have you been? Persecuting socialists? I don't persecute socialists. Well, last I heard, you were keeping tabs on members of our actual government. Oh, well, that's absolute nonsense. You know, if they were a bit too left-wing for you. All right, Larson, let's play nicely. And where's the fun in that? Perhaps we could begin by hearing something about your South American experience. Uh, what do you want to know? Uh, well, I'd like to know what you think happened. We know what happened. But we haven't heard Gunvald's personal opinion. Uh, OK, yes. Yeah. So, um, does you know, I was there to observe the security plan for this visiting president. Not a popular character. A dictator, basically. So plenty of reasons why people might want him dead. But they had a very good team in charge of the whole operation. They were meticulous. I mean, I saw the plan and I couldn't imagine how it could go wrong. But it did go wrong. Horribly wrong. Yeah, it did. And what made the explosion so lethal was that it was placed on one of the city's gas mains. And it must have been detonated by radio by someone who was some distance away. So, how did he know when to detonate the bomb? I mean, if whoever it was, if they were so far away? I think he was watching it all on TV. Right. What are we supposed to do in that case? Have some kind of media blackout? I don't know. I haven't got any immediate solutions. I'm just saying what I think. OK, and where do you think the security team went wrong? Well, I don't think they should have published the route of the motorcade. But, but then people don't get the chance to cheer and wave. Or to demonstrate. Well, we don't want to encourage demonstrations. Well, we won't need to encourage them. So they shouldn't have published the route of the motorcade, right? What, what else? Uh, another thing, if at the last minute they changed the route for any reason, the terrorists had it covered. What do you mean? Well, there were several explosives planted elsewhere. They're still finding them now. Christ. Another mistake was that they set up the controls at the airports too late. They began all that two days beforehand, when it should have been weeks, maybe months, I don't know. Well, this is all very depressing, I must say. And the group? The terrorists who claimed responsibility? Ulag. Muller, what can you tell us about this group? Only what my sources tell me. Your sources being the CIA? I'm afraid I'm not permitted to say. <laughs> well, if you can just tell us what you know. Ulag have carried out several assassinations. First time was in March last year when the president of Costa Rica was shot in Tegucigalpa. Then in September in Malawi, two African presidents were in a building that exploded. Forty people died. Then there was India. India? You'll remember India. Um... One of the northern states. State president was attacked at the train station by several men with hand grenades and machine guns. Oh, of course. Several hundred school children were there and 50 of them died. Right, yes, OK. But in India, they got a description. How did they do that? Well, apparently the terrorists weren't masked. They were just wearing hard hats, like construction workers. And a tall European-looking bloke, his helmet fell off and a policeman said he had blonde hair and sideburns. Well, they traced one man who fitted that description, but he left the country before he could be stopped had a Rhodesian passport and went by the name of Reinhard Heydrich. OK. But Reinhard Heydrich doesn't exist. It was a false passport. So, all we've got is a tall blonde man with sideburns. Yeah. Not much to go on. Nope. Well, as you know, the US Senator is arriving in November and we need someone to take charge of security measures. Martin, you are, of course, the obvious man for the job. Am I? Last on here... Malm and myself were talking this morning and our decision was quite unanimous. Right, tell him you'll organise the preliminary investigation, long-term security, everything. How am I supposed to do that? With staff from the murder squad and violent crimes, but only if someone takes care of the short-range security. I mean, that's the easy bit. Even Muller can manage it. Larson, what are you mumbling about? Uh, Beck and I would like to undertake all long-range security, preventative measures, etc. If Muller can take care of the short-range stuff. What do you think of that, Muller? That sounds fine. Yeah, you should be all right with that, Muller. I could do it with the thickest 20 policemen in the country. I do object to your tone. Well, he's a piece of piss. All right, Larson, that's enough. So, Beck, you'll take the job? Do I have a choice? Not really, no. And so it began. The long, tedious process of preparation. Involving too many hours on the telephone, too many hours at the office, and not enough hours with Raya Nielsen. And Beck didn't even have the company of his beloved friend Colbert to console him. 
Colbert had left the police force 18 months earlier, and there was no one else like him at Kungsholmsgarten or Vesperia or anywhere else. Sometimes Beck just sat and stared into space, wishing Colbert was back. If the summer of 1974 was not easy for Beck, it was almost unbearable for Rebecca Lind. On August the 24th, she wrote again to Jim's parents. Dear Mr and Mrs Cosgrove, since Jim left in January, I've not heard from him. It's now five months that have gone. Do you know where he is? I know that he would write to me if he could, because he is a good and honest boy and he loves me and our daughter very much. She's now 11 months and very beautiful. Please write to me and tell me what has happened to Jim. With many thanks and good greetings, Rebecca. At the end of September, she received a reply from Mrs. Cosgrove. Dear Rebecca, I'm sorry to tell you that Jim has been sentenced to four years in prison for the crime of desertion. I'm afraid we can do nothing financially for you and the child on account of Mr. Cosgrove being so ill with cancer. We have a great number of medical bills to attend to, so you mustn't expect any help of this kind. I just wanted to be clear about that. Below is the address of the prison where Jim is being held, but they move them about so much it's sometimes hard to know if a letter will reach him. I'm sorry to tell you this. Yours sincerely, from Mrs. Cosgrove. That night, Rebecca held her baby close to her and wept. When she woke up the next morning, the sun was shining and she made a decision. She would go and visit Theobald Braxing, the man otherwise known as Crasher. So, Roberta... Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca. What can I do for you? I need to write to the Prime Minister. I see. Is it possible to do that? To, to write to someone like that? Oh, yes. Yes, it is. Good. Uh, why do you want to write to the Prime Minister? Well, in the newspapers it says that there's a senator coming here. An American. And this American, well, he's a senator in the state where Jim is from. Go on. Keep going. So, well, what I thought is that the Prime Minister could could talk to this Senator person, the one who's, who's come in here and explain about me and Jim and the baby, and, and then the Senator might help us. What do you think? Well, well, it, it's certainly worth a try. Hi. Hi. You look exhausted. You look beautiful. In red wellies and a duffel coat. Yeah. <laughs> well, can I come in? Yeah, please do. <sighs> what have you got in the fridge? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I brought some food then. Do you think it was wrong of me to take the job? Huh. What would have happened if you'd refused? My chances are they'd have given it to someone else. Who? Malm, my so-called chief. And you'd have screwed it up, I suppose? Yeah. You want an honest answer? Mm, as if I have a choice. <laughs> well, I think it was wrong. Oh? Because he doesn't deserve your protection. I mean, people should be protected from him. You know he was involved in Chile in the assassination of Allende and God knows how many other innocent lives. Well, we don't know that for sure. Martin. Well, we don't. And he was quite open about wanting to drop a bomb on China. Well, that's true. I mean, our supposedly socialist government invites a famous reactionary, a dangerous warmongering arsehole, as an honoured guest, and he'll sit there with the Prime Minister at some bloody banquet talking about the recession, and he'll never see a single demonstrator. Oh, that's, that's not true. Everyone will be allowed to demonstrate. Uh, if the government doesn't get scared and talk you out of it. Mm. Am I boring you? No, no, you never bore me. I'm just knackered. <laughs> OK. This will be ready in four minutes. You can eat and then sleep. Sorry. It's all right. It's me who's the boring one. Yeah. I suppose the only good thing is that if you save his life, then you'll probably save lots of other lives as well, won't you? I mean, if there was a bomb, it wouldn't just be him, it could be 40 or 50 other people that would die. Yeah, easily. So that's something. Yeah. Yeah, that's not nothing. 
On the 14th of October, a tall blonde man with sideburns and a British passport arrived in Sweden via the hydrofoil from Copenhagen to Malmö. In Malmö, he bought a train ticket to Stockholm. And from the train station in Stockholm, he took a taxi to his pre-rented apartment in Sudermalm. Where are you from? England. Really? Whereabouts? London. I have an aunt who lives in Manchester. Apparently it rains a lot. A bit like here. <laughs> the man's passport was made out in the name of businessman Andrew Black. His real name was Reinhard Height. His nationality was South African, and he was a trained terrorist. Three days later, he was joined by two Japanese men, both of whom were explosives experts. They all stayed together in the flat in Sudermalm, where they quietly made their preparations to assassinate the American senator. By mid-October, Martin Beck's preparations to keep the senator alive were being finalised. What's that? Motorcade route. Well, we've actually made a bloody decision. Yeah, so... Can I have a look? Uh-huh. Prime Minister meets Senator yeah. VIP room airport. And there's photos of press. Motorcade leaves the airport, goes through Nortal. They arrive at the palace. What's this bit about the wreath? Uh, he's going to lay a wreath for the dead king. Why? I don't know. Well, the king's been dead for a year. A uh, senator liked the king or something. He liked the king? Actually, he made a statement saying that the king was one of the greatest Swedes of our time. <sighs> but I wasn't going to tell you that in case he got angry. What, me? Angry? Mm. On the 1st of November, Reinhard Height was scouting for the perfect location to place the explosives. Armed with a complete plan of the city subway, sewage, gas and electricity supply systems. He was walking eastwards along Schuppmann Garden when a woman came out of an alley right in front of him. Oh, <laughs> sorry. No, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Me neither. Um, oh, you go first. Oh, thanks. He continued to walk a few metres behind her. She was wearing red wellies and a duffel coat. Suddenly she turned around and looked at him, as if she felt she was being followed. He smiled his most charming smile. She did not smile back. On the 14th of November... Exactly one week before the arrival of the senator, Martin Beck called a meeting. A crucial meeting involving Larsson, Rhön, Skaka and Melander. So this is the question. We know the route of the motorcade and so does everyone else. Now, where on the map would you place the bomb? Now, wait, wait don't tell me. Just think about it for a second. All right, now raise your hand when you've made a decision. Okay, so everyone's decided? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Miranda. You want me to say where I place the bomb? Please. Here. Ren? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, me too. Skaka? Yeah. I'm with everyone else. All right, so we all think it's here. Then we're probably wrong, aren't we? Well, not necessarily. Okay, so everyone needs to write down their reasons for choosing that exact location independently. You've got ten minutes. Skaka, tell the switchboard we're not taking any calls or receiving any visitors, whoever they are. Even the commissioner. Especially the bloody commissioner. The meeting went on for almost two hours. Afterwards, Martin felt extremely satisfied. This was a good team. True, he'd had to explain himself now and again, in a way that would never have been necessary in the days of Lennart Colbert. But it was a good team nonetheless. And now they had a plan, the details of which were known only to them. Ramon? Yeah? You need to look at this. What is it? It's a file on Reinhardt Height. Reinhardt Height? Apparently he's South African and a member of Ulang. Really? Yeah, there's a photo. Photo? It's the blonde bloke with the sideburns, the one they spotted in India. Where's this come from? South American intelligence. Well, why are we only getting it now? I suppose they didn't have it till now. I take it with me? Yeah. Mm. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, see you. <sighs> Do you remember when we first met? Mm. You were so unlike anybody else. <laughs> you still are. <laughs> Christ. 
Christ, my life is so much better with you in it. Good. Go to sleep. What are you going to do? I need to do some work. Really? Just for a bit. Sleep. You need it. Okay. Rhea Nielsen was a curious person, mostly in quite a straightforward kind of way. She worked for an hour or two, then she saw the file sitting on top of Beck's briefcase, and she opened it. She saw the photo of the blonde man with the sideburns, and thought she recognised him from somewhere. But where? Where could she have seen him? You okay? Yeah, fine. The Army Museum in Stockholm was on Riddergarten in Östermalm, in the old barracks. In a small office at the back of the building, a man sat studying a chess problem. Also on the table lay a dismembered pistol and beside his chair, a wooden crate full of firearms. The man with the chess problem was Leonard Colbert, Martin Beck's closest colleague during many difficult years. Hello. Hi. What are you doing here? I, uh, I need you to do a job for me. Really? Yeah, I can pay you. How much? Lots. Great. Got an unrestricted budget. Blimey. What for? Protecting this senator. Oh, that reactionary arsehole. Yeah, that's him. And he's coming on Thursday and I'm in charge of security. Why are you? I don't know. I just got roped into it. What do you want me to do? Read through these papers and see if you can spot anything weird. Uh, quickly? As soon as you can. Okay. Thank you, Leno. Isn't this an elegant gun? It's a nickel-plated ladies' revolver. American women used to carry them in their handbags in about 1900. Don't know why. She'd be lucky to hit a cabbage with it. It was then that Martin Beck decided to make a detour that he didn't really have time for. He went to visit Theobald Braxane, the lawyer otherwise known as Crasher. Yes? About six months ago, I testified on your behalf in a case. Ah, yes. Rebecca Lund. Lind. Yes, Lind. Christ, I do sometimes wonder if I don't lose a certain number of cases because of this name business. Anyway, uh, yes, yes, it, it was very good of you to testify. I'd say it had an influence, uh, quite an influence on the outcome. Has anything happened to Rebecca? Uh, no, no, nothing's happened, not as far as I know. Anyway, I, I just wondered if you'd seen her. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, uh, I have, because she came here in September and, uh, well, I, I wrote a letter on her behalf. A letter to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister? Yes. She seemed to think he could help her in some way, so we wrote the letter together and I, uh, I sent it that very day. Did you get a reply? Yes, but it was perfectly useless. Do you have an address for her? No, well, uh, she didn't have a permanent home. She was staying with friends, I think. Mean. Well, if she turns up, I'd appreciate it if you could let me know. Why do you want to find her? I, I honestly don't know. I, I just keep thinking of her. Thinking maybe I could help her. I, I've no idea how, but... Well, I'll certainly let you know if I see her again. Thank you. Martin Beck returned to the museum the following morning. Here's your money. Huh. Me and Gunn will have a night on the town. What do you think of the plan? It's good. It's a good plan. But? Well, if there's any point trying to tell Muller anything at all, then you could point out that he's got two difficult moments when the senator's standing on Low Gordon with the king, and a less difficult situation when the senator and the prime minister are laying that wreath. Uh, what else? Tell Einar Run he should never again try to express himself in writing. Okay. Or he's never going to get promoted. Okay. Is that it? Yep. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for your help. Any time. Once he had Colbert's positive opinion of their plan, he felt much better. Reinhardt Height, like Martin Beck, thought everything seemed ready. He'd moved to an apartment in Solna, and the two Japanese men had stayed in Sudamalm. They had assembled their bombs, and their only task was to place them as late as possible. The radio expert arrived safely via a Danish fishing boat. He was French. His name was Levalois, and he brought some unwelcome news. 
They have a photo of you. Who do? Interpol. How? I don't know how, but they have a photo and they have your real name. <sighs> Shit. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, what does it change? <laughs> well, you tell me. The operation itself can still go ahead. The same as before. You think? I think so, yes. Why not? Okay, well, you shouldn't go out at all. That's okay, that's fine. But I need you to get rid of the car. Okay, I can do that. And when it's over? And when it's over, that's the problem. Well, how do you mean? Well, well, how am I going to leave the country? Well, you'll have to wait. Yeah. Lie low, as they say. Yeah. The Japanese terrorists placed the bombs that night. The one that mattered, and the other two less important ones. The day before the senator's arrival was a Wednesday. It was the longest Wednesday of Martin Beck's life. In total, the National Police Commissioner sent 42 documents over to Kung's Holmes Garden, all of them dealing with completely obvious matters that had been decided weeks before. Beck speaking. This is Commander Mankell here. Hello, Commander. I was just wondering whether you want the big Vertol helicopters or our smaller Alouettes. Actually, we don't need any aeroplanes at all. Chief Inspector. Yes. A helicopter is not an aeroplane. It's an aircraft. Ah, uh, sorry. I don't really know the terminology. But we're going to use uh, police helicopters. Oh. Well, I was just speaking to the National Commissioner. Well, I think there's been some kind of miscommunication. I see. Well, in that case, I'll leave you to it. What now? Nothing. Hello. You all right, Run? Yeah, yeah, just knackered. You all set? Yeah, we're all set, but uh, tomorrow. It's going to take longer than I thought it would. It's going to take the full 15 minutes. But you won't have 15 minutes. I thought that's what we had, 15 minutes. Well, I'd say you've got more like 12 or 13. 12 or 13? At best. That's... That's not brilliant news. Well, you can do it, you can. On the day tomorrow, there'll be adrenaline and everyone will move faster. They move pretty fast today, actually. Ah, oh, these bloody phones. Hello, Beck speaking. Hello, Larson speaking. At 11 o'clock that night, Martin Beck switched out all the lights in the office and locked the doors. He had an unpleasant feeling that he neglected something, but he didn't know what it could be. Four minutes after Beck left the building, Larson, haunted by a similar feeling, returned to the office, sat down at his desk and began to read through all the paperwork that dealt with security. At midnight, there was a knock at the door. Yes? Sorry to bother you. Uh, what do you want? I saw the light on. Yeah? My name's Root Solomonson. I work here. I'm a police assistant. Do you want to see my ID? Yes. Root Solomonson, 25, police assistant. Yeah, go on. What do you want? I know you're working on this job, this security job for the senator. And how do you know that? Well, everyone, I'm, I mean, most people know that. And well, I've heard that you're looking for someone, a man, a tall blonde. This video was uploaded to the channel Thinking Out Louder. Please like, comment and subscribe to the Thinking Out Louder channel. Thank you. man. And where did you get that from? The identification department. I've got a friend who works there. Can I sit down? No. Uh, what do you want to tell me? I think I met him. Who? The man you're looking for, I think. Wait a minute, wait a minute. When was this? Uh, a few weeks ago. Have you got a date? The 4th of November, a Monday. Okay. We went to the Amarante. It's a bar. Yeah, I know it's a bar. It's a pickup joint. Well, yes. And you picked up some tall blonde bloke, and now you think you've slept with a terrorist. Shall I tell you what happened or not? Go on. I met a Danish businessman who said his name was Jorgensen and went back to my apartment, and yes, we slept together. Congratulations. What is the matter with you? What is the matter with you? I'm trying to tell you something. We'll get to the point, woman. I called his hotel a few days later and the receptionist said that there was no one of that name staying in the hotel and never had been. So he lied, so what? Well then I spoke to my friend, the one who came to the bar with me, and I mentioned about this Danish man and she said that she didn't think he was Danish at all because she'd lived in Denmark for several years and the way he spoke didn't sound right. Well, what did he call himself again? Reinhard Jorgensen. What did he look like? Like you, but younger. 
20 years younger and he had sideburns. Was he as tall as me? Yes, but he weighed less. Did he look like this? That's him. When did you last see him? Um, the morning of the fifth. Do you know anything else? Nothing whatsoever. Okay. At Reyes flat in Tula Garten, Martin Beck ate au gratin ham sandwiches with parmesan while everyone around him discussed the imminent arrival of the reactionary arsehole. Later when Beck and Ray were almost asleep, Reyes said, Martin? Yeah? I've got a confession. What is it? I hope when you were here last Thursday, you were very tired you went to bed before me. Do you remember? Yeah. And there was this file sitting on your briefcase and I read it. I don't know why. I was just curious. And there was a photo of a man. Reinhardt Height. Yeah. I've seen him before. What? I've seen him. Are you absolutely and completely sure? Yes. When? Three weeks ago. We bumped into each other in Schuppmann Garten. And then we walked through Bolhus Alley. I thought he was a tourist because he had a map of Stockholm. Did he say anything? Well, he apologised when we bumped into each other. And a few minutes later, I saw him get into a green car with Swedish registration plates. And I don't know why, but I remember the letters, not the numbers. Just the letters, because they spelled Goz. G-O-Z? Yeah. Can, can I use the phone? Of course. Of course, Larson was not at home to receive Beck's call, but it didn't take Beck long to track him down. Heights here. I know. How do you know? Well, it turns out he shagged a Swedish policewoman. Oh, right. How do you know? I got a witness. A woman who saw him in Schutman Garden about three weeks ago. Is she reliable, your witness? The most reliable person I know. Shit. Grunwald Larsson and Martin Beck spent the early hours of the morning thinking intensely. They were handicapped by self-reproach, humiliation and deadly fatigue. Both realised they were no longer young. Morning came and they still had no new ideas. When Skaka and Melanda turned up, Beck explained the most recent development. Uh, do any of you think that this new information should alter our plans? As far as I can see, this is the very situation that we reckoned on. So I can't see why we should revise our plans at this stage. Mm. Do you think we ought to tell Run? No because his job is difficult enough already. What level of risk are Run and his men actually taking? Massive, massive risk. Right, if this bloody man Height or any of his colleagues, whatever you call them, fellow terrorists, get out of this country alive, then I will take it as a personal defeat. Okay, so there are a few details that only us four and of course Run know anything about. This means that if it all goes wrong, then we're the ones who'll have to take the blame. I have no objection to that. Melanda? Well, I can't say that, like Benny, I've no objection. I've got a fair bit to lose if we all get dismissed, namely my pension. But I'm prepared to take a calculated risk. So, we stick to the plan, yeah? Yes. There's one of the helicopters. Guess who's in it? Who? Mal. Really? Mm -hmm. I told him it'd be ideal for liaison, and he believed me. Christ, he does love a helicopter. Well, that's what I was counting on. Clever. Thanks. All radio units to observe signal Q from now on. I repeat, signal Q to be observed until counter orders are received. Uh -huh. Only instructions from Chief Inspector Beck will be forwarded. They are not to be answered. Signal Q was highly unusual. It involved total silence on the police radio. Gunvald Larsson parked outside the terminal. The plane hadn't landed yet. Despite everything that had happened, they had plenty of time. At least several Bloody minutes. Hell. What? I didn't have time to shower or change. Well, that's Heights' fault. I knew I was going to wear my new suit. The senator was a tall, sunburned man with sparkling white teeth. He looked around the desolate airfield, then raised his white ten-gallon hat and waved gaily at the demonstrators on the terrace. In the apartment in Solna, 
Height and his French colleague Lavalois were watching television. Only one thing irritated Height. Why can't we hear the police radio? They've stopped broadcasting. So have the cars. Could there be anything wrong with our equipment? No. There's no chance of that. Ah, that Q signal. Must have meant radio silence. But it's not on my list. Probably. Yeah, it's very rare. Yeah, that must be it. I'll check again. <laughs> What's funny? <sighs> they think they can fool us by not using their radio. What good will that do them? The senator is something of a fitness fanatic. Apparently a fine base. The man's an asshole. Yep. Well, I suppose we knew that already. Yep. At least we're in a decent car for them. The decent car was a Porsche. And why does he keep waving at the demonstrators like they're all his best friends? I mean, has he read any of those banners? Maybe he's short-sighted but too vain to wear glasses. Wouldn't go with the hat. Exactly. He'd look like the Milky Bar kid. In the apartment in Solna, Haidt and Levalois were waiting for the moment. The senator's bulletproof custom-built car is now passing Stalmes Targorten, where the governor is giving a gala banquet tonight. The streets are absolutely heaving with demonstrators. And the moment was very close. The car is leaving Solna and crossing the Stockholm city boundary. Very, very close. Haidt let his finger rest very lightly on the white button as he watched the television screens. A few seconds left. Oh, what a waste of a damn good car. No. He pressed the button at exactly the right time. But nothing happened. The television showed the motorcade passing Nortor <laughs> and turning into Sveavagen. Oh, shit. We screwed up. The bomb didn't go off. <laughs> so he lives? No. The senator lives. What? We didn't screw up. The charge detonated. Well, that's impossible. How is that possible? I don't know. What happened? What happened was that Reinhard Height detonated the bomb at exactly the right time for no one to be injured. And what he blew up was exactly 2,091 sandbags and a huge mountain of fireproof fiberglass insulation. And if you happen to be drinking soda water in the Parliament building, then it sounded something like this. What in God's name was that? I'm afraid I don't know. It was a hell of a ruckus. It certainly was. Could it have been an earthquake? Oh, I doubt it. At that moment, the senator and the prime minister were interrupted. Uh, we're sorry to bother you. I'm not sorry. Neither of you is needed here. We're looking for Eric Muller. He isn't needed here either. Uh, that was a hell of a ruckus just now. Yes, what was that? It was an unsuccessful attempt to blow up the senator's car. A bomb? More or less. Well, was anybody hurt? No. Thanks to us. See to it that the people responsible are arrested immediately. Yeah, uh, that's quite a tall order. Twenty minutes after the explosion, the National Police Commissioner was railing at Stig Malm. One hell of a fine liaison officer you are. <laughs> my dear Commissioner. Shut up! Sorry? I do not wish to be addressed as my dear. I am the senior executive in this country's police force. Sorry? What the hell just happened? I don't know. A liaison officer who doesn't know anything. <laughs> Martin Beck is really the man. And where the hell is he? Where are any of them? Larson? Melanda? Packer or Macca? Skacker. Whatever the hell he's called. It's Skacker. I don't care. I don't care what he's called. Hello. Beck, Larson, you better have a bloody good explanation. For what? For everything. What exactly just happened? Um, well, myself, Larson, Skaka, Melanda and Rune, we made a calculation. A calculation? Hmm. Of the most likely place for a bomb attempt. And it turned out that we all hit on the same place. Which was Nortel. But there was no point at all in diverting the motorcade. Because the chances were that there were other bombs waiting elsewhere. So we decided to do something a bit different. What the hell was that? And why didn't anyone else know what you were up to? Well, uh, we can explain if you'll let us. First of all, we talked to the head of broadcasting and he agreed eventually not to send anything live. Everything was to be broadcast 15 minutes later. We stressed the importance of absolute secrecy. We also had the police radio silenced. We gave the most difficult assignment to run. 
he had to evacuate the whole area of Nortel, as well as limit the damage caused by the bomb. All of that in 15 minutes. How did he manage to do it? With two loudspeaker vans, two fire engines and a hell of a lot of sandbags. 25 lorries of sandbags. And a repair van from the gas board, three ambulances. Plus a water tanker and the rest of the fire brigade all standing by in Danamora Garden. He also had 30 hand-picked policemen and women. After the motorcade had gone, he had about 12 minutes in which to dam up the section of the street under which a bomb might have been placed. He also had to block all roads and see that the area was evacuated. Twelve minutes was not enough for all that. But fortunately, it turned out he had a little more than that. Fourteen minutes and thirteen seconds, in fact. <sighs> Incredible. The man deserves a medal. And no one was injured? No one at all? Well, there's a gas pipe that's knackered. That'll need fixing. A couple of window panes. And that's it? Yes, that's it. Extraordinary. Yes, extraordinary. Congratulations, gentlemen. Yes, congratulations, gentlemen. Malmi, you sound like a bloody parrot. Um, I think we need to get going. Going? In 33 minutes, that wreath business starts. <laughs> I'm sure Merla has got all that under control. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd still like to be there. Uh, so would I. Martin. Yes? What do you think the chances are of another bombing? Well, it's unlikely. Still, it's no reason to let up on security. No, well, that's true. Absolutely. And do we still need to get our hands on the terrorists? Thirty minutes later, Beck and Larson stood in the pouring rain, looking out over Beer Yoyal Square. Where the Senator and the Prime Minister approached the church very slowly, perfectly protected by giant umbrellas. What a god-awful wreath. Yeah. Looks like a giant pink doll. <laughs> it does. And what idiot thought to look it right across the square? I don't know. Why are they stopping? Looks like they're discussing the statue of Beer Yoyal. For Christ's sake, he's chucking it down. The senator's obviously very interested in medieval statesmen. This rain is ruining my shoes. I mean, permanently ruining them. Yours and everyone else's. Yeah, but everyone else's aren't made of Italian sweat, aren't they? They might certainly aren't. Oh, look. What? Coming out of the church. Who's that? Sacrosan. Oh. Oh, there's Christian son, shit, and Cavasmo. What the hell are they doing here? The procession finally arrived. Just as they were about to walk up the steps, someone came out of the church. A young girl with fair hair and a pale, serious face. In both hands, she was holding a small revolver. She raised her arms and fired. Jesus Christ! The Prime Minister died the moment the bullet went into his brain. The Prime Minister's bodyguard stood, still holding a giant umbrella. He stared with astonishment at the dead man. Chaos broke out then, and everyone started screaming. Martin Beck had often sat in an interview room with someone who had killed someone else. But that someone else had never before been the leader of a country. Where are you living at the moment? I'm staying with a friend. Camilla's with her now. Do you think she'll be allowed to stay there? At least for the time being? I'm sure she will. Do you want to call your friend? In a bit, maybe. You also have a right to a lawyer. Would you like Mr. Braxane? He helped me write a letter. I know. Really? I saw a copy at his office the day before yesterday. I hope you don't mind. Why should I mind? Well, it was your letter. It was private. I don't care. Could you tell me what happened today? But, you know, everyone knows. I mean, how long did you think about it? About killing the Prime Minister? Yes. Well, yesterday I got a letter from Jim's mother. Jim killed himself on the 22nd of October. And was that when you decided, when you got the letter? Yes. Where did you get the revolver? It was given to me a few years ago. When my aunt died, she left me a few of her things and the revolver was one of them. I didn't even know if it worked. It's pretty old. It is. At least 80 years old. I saw one just like it a few weeks ago in a museum. My friend told me you'd be lucky to hit a cabbage with it. Maybe they'll put this one in a museum, too. The gun that shot the Prime Minister. How did you manage to get into the church? I went there and hid last night. 
I had some water and some crackers with me so I didn't get hungry. And this morning some policemen came into the church. Two of them I recognised. Really? They were the two men who arrested me at the bank. Christianson and Gvastmu? I think so. And there was another man. They called him Sack something. Sacrison. That sounds right. Anyway, they just had a quick look around. They didn't see me. That's because they're three of the worst policemen in the world. Well, anyway... Why exactly did you want to kill the Prime Minister? He, he could have just said that he would try. That he would try and talk to the Senator. But the letter I got back from his office was, was so... So... Inhuman. Inhuman, yes. You know, I think most people know perfectly well that they're being cheated and betrayed by the politicians, but they're too scared to say anything. And it doesn't help to protest either, because that just gets ignored. That's why I shot him. So that maybe they'll get scared and understand that people aren't so powerless as they think. Good day. There you are then, Roberta. Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca. Hello. Uh, I saw it all on television and came here as quickly as I could. Thank you. Is, uh, is this the gun? Yes. Not bad. Not bad at all, hitting someone with that little thing. I'll, uh, I'll leave you to it. All right. Now, Rebecca, let's try and sort this all out, shall we? At the apartment in Solna, Height said to Levalois, I know what happened. Really? What? They fooled us. There was a time, lad. We set the bomb off after the motorcade had gone. And that's why they kept the police radio silent. That is pretty slick. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. I underestimated the police here. They're not as stupid as they look. Apparently. God, I want to know who. Who? Who it was that tricked us. But what does it matter? Look, these things happen. You can't win them all, eh? Hey. Are you off? Yeah. Train safer, I think. Yeah. Train then boat. Hey. How are you going to leave? I don't know yet. Malmö, maybe? Oslo or Helsingborg? What about the other two? They've decided to wait. Why? Well, this damn business with the Prime Minister. Oh. Yeah, it's complicated everything. Hmm. But you should be okay. On a fishing boat. No customs. I think so too. The following day, the senator left Sweden. There were demonstrations along the route, but far fewer than the day before. The weather was terrible, and it seemed that yesterday's unexpected development had caused many to lose heart. The senator waved and smiled. In the car on the way back from Arlanda Airport, Gunvald Larsson said, I hope the plane crashes and the bastard dies. It's unlikely. Yeah, it's just too much to bloody ass. At least now we can get on with finding the terrorists. That's true. And we've got two decent clues. The green car. Yeah. And the photo of height. Yeah. Well, if the car wasn't stolen, then it was either purchased or rented. By the way, it should be traceable. Let's put Run and Skacker on that. Skacker never gives up, and Run's good on routine. You didn't used to think that. Yeah. Well, I've changed my mind. On Friday afternoon, the 22nd of November 1974, Rebecca Lind was once again in court for formal arraignment proceedings. And Crasher was once again defending her. Someone once said that our country is a small but hungry capitalist state. This judgment is correct. For a pure-hearted thinking person, this young woman, for instance, who will shortly be taken into custody and whose life is already ruined, a system such as ours must seem incomprehensible and downright hostile. She realised that someone must bear the responsibility for this system, and when that someone could not be contacted by ordinary human efforts, she was overwhelmed by despair. Rebecca Lind has committed a murder, and naturally, I cannot oppose her arrest. The prosecution believes she is insane. But I do not. I believe that this young woman is wiser 
and more right thinking than most of us. It took the magistrate less than 30 seconds to declare that Rebecca Lynn be taken to the State Psychiatric Institute for long-term evaluation. It took Run and Skaka slightly more than a week to locate the right rental car firm. He'd used the name Andrew Black and a false address. Unfortunately for him, he had chosen an address that happened to be very close to the apartment where the two Japanese men were still living. When Skaka showed the 800th person a photo of height, she said, Oh, yes. He lived in this building with two Japanese gentlemen. The, the two Japanese men are still here, as a matter of fact. But I believe this man moved out. So, so how long is it since you've seen one of them? In, in, in the lift or, or wherever? Well, it's at least two weeks. Possibly three. I saw them both in the foyer, mm. and they had so much shopping, so much food with them. I asked if they were having a party, and they just smiled and shook their heads. Oh, they were very nice, but they didn't sort of hang around and chat. From an apartment in the Tanto area, Einar Run was observing the two Japanese terrorists. In ten hours, he'd seen them move twice. On both occasions, they'd been armed with machine guns. When Skaka arrived to take over, he said, mm. Larson wants to get them alive. <laughs> Does he? But how the heck are we supposed to do that? Gunvold doesn't like killing people. You wouldn't think that, would you? To look at him, to hear him talking. Well, he doesn't mind punching people. I know, I've seen him. Look, don't touch that curtain, OK? I won't. And if anything happens, call Beck or Larson. Yeah, OK. And Skaka. What? Don't try anything stupid, will you? Like what? Like shooting them. I could do it, you know. From here. If I had the right rifle. I'm a bloody good shot. No, I'm not. At Kung's Holmes Garden, Melanda was about to leave for his requisite ten hours sleep. Do you think that's the whole terrorist unit? These two Japanese and height? Uh, there were probably four, and the fourth one's already gone. How do you know that? It's just a guess. It's his famous intuition again. It's just a guess. He doesn't like us referring to his famous intuition. Larson. Well, you don't, do But every now and again, it saves all our asses. So if you say there were probably four of them, but one of them's left, then you're probably right. Well, that's all I'm saying. OK, so what do we do now? I mean, presumably, these two Japanese blokes are heavily armed. Armed to the teeth. So what do we do? They might even blow themselves up. Well, I want to get them alive. How do we do that? We'll have to think of something really good. It's a standard apartment building, isn't it? With emergency stairs. Yeah, why? And the emergency stairs back onto the apartment, don't they? Yes, why? Well, you see, my brother-in-law happens to live in the same kind of building. And when I was helping him put a mirror up, quite a big, ugly, gilt thing, half of it fell straight through the wall, out into the emergency stairs, and the rest of the wall collapsed into their neighbour's living room. What did the neighbour say? Well, he was a bit surprised. He was watching TV. Anyway, something to think about, isn't it? If we're going to take them from three or four directions. Yeah, I suppose it is. I'm going home now, to bed. And I'd rather not be woken up by either of you, if that's at all possible. OK. Go get your beauty sleep, Melanda. Yep. Sleep is the key to my beauty. Must be why me and Beck are so ugly. You speak for yourself. Good night, gentlemen. While things were comparatively calm at Kung's Holmes Garden, Beck and Larson began to transform Melanda's idea into a plan. Right, their attention will be concentrated on the door, especially as there's only one. They'll be expecting someone to come hurtling in with a posse of policemen. I think they'll kill as many people as they can and then blow themselves to pieces. Well, we have to try and take them alive. We have to do it without Malm and 12 helicopters and 50 police dogs. Christ. Three men should be enough. One from the balcony, one through the door, and one from that emergency stairway. What, through the wall? Exactly. <laughs> that should be you. Well, they go through the wall. Don't you think? Well, I'd rather break the door down. Why? Just like breaking doors down. OK. Well, anyway, whoever goes through the wall will need a pneumatic drill and a silencer. Yeah, we can make some artificial noise, can't we? Yeah, but that's not going to completely cover it. No, no, I suppose not. All the time they'll be keeping an eye on the door, and then the wall will come crashing in. So I think the man coming from the balcony has got the best chance. Yeah, I agree. 
Which men do you think we should use? Well, two are pretty obvious. You and me? I mean, it's our bloody stupid idea. Yeah, exactly. But who's the third man? I don't know, uh, Skaka, maybe? No, he's too young. He's got kids. I couldn't stand seeing him shot dead. Well, who could you stand seeing shot dead? <sighs> Melanda's too old. Well, we're not young. Well, I mean, I think he would do it, but it doesn't seem fair to ask. And he's a bit slow. Wish I had Colbert. Yeah, but we don't. Okay, yeah, so that leaves Run. Run's got a kid as well. Yeah, but his son's a bit older. Well, so that's okay if he dies, then? Oh, of course not. Right, let's think. Um, he has certain disadvantages, which I think we're both aware of, but he's got one major advantage, which is that he's worked with us for a long time and he knows how we think. Well, he certainly knows how you think. Well, he knows how you think, too. He, he just doesn't show it. Uh, we'll have to talk to him, ask him. He doesn't have to say yes. <sighs> we need to sleep. Sleep? Yeah. We haven't got time. Could sleep in the cells. Well, that'll be comfortable. It's better than nothing. Well, I'm not sure it is. Rune's red nose did not appear in the doorway at Kungsholm's garden until just before nine. Beck let Larson do the talking. When Larson had finished, Einar Run stared at the other two men. It's suicide. No, it's not. <laughs> Have you shown this so-called plan to Melanda? Well, the basic idea was his. Hmm. And did he volunteer to carry it out? No, but I think he would. Uh, if you didn't take the job, you don't have to do it. I think it could work, ain't it? I really do. And I think you and me and him, we could manage it. <sighs> oh, bloody hell, is that it? Is that it all written down? Yeah. Let me read it. <sighs> I presume it's you who comes rushing through the front door? Yeah. And Martin who comes in through the balcony? Yes. And I'm the idiot that comes crashing through the wall? Yeah. It was Friday the 13th of December, but everyone was too scared to make any jokes about this fact. Outside, ten pneumatic drills, two trench diggers and four paving machines were making an almost incomprehensible racket. All of this heavy machinery was manned by policemen wearing coveralls borrowed from the highway department. Inside the building, Run was in the stairwell with three men. Together they were doing a pretty good job of drilling small holes into the wall that went just deep enough for the entire thing to collapse when the time was right. Martin Beck, meanwhile, was lying stretched out on the balcony one floor up, a light aluminium ladder beside him. At five past nine, Larson kicked in the door and hurtled into the apartment. The larger Japanese man leapt up from his breakfast with his machine gun in his hands. But at that exact moment, the whole wall to the right of him collapsed. Large sections of it came crashing into the living room, together with Run, looking truly ferocious with his Walther pistol. And Martin Beck kicked in the balcony door. Larson took full advantage of the man's confusion and hit him across the head. Almost simultaneously, two small wooden boxes fell to the floor. From each box was a thread that was fastened to each man's wrist. A famously hopeless shot, Run raised his pistol and shot off the thread to the detonator with inhuman precision. Then Larson threw himself at the man. While Run calmly said, Martin, the thread. Faced with two opponents and virtually disarmed since Martin Beck had struck his machine gun out of his hands, the smaller man did something he could not afford to do. He looked at Run with amazement. And Martin Beck took a pair of scissors out of his coat and snipped the thread. The larger man was at least 20 years younger than Larson, enormously strong and a skilled fighter. But what use was this against Larson in a mindless rage? By the final punch, the man was bloody and unconscious. That's enough! Don't vouch, stop! Sorry. That, that doesn't happen to me. I mean, I mean, not anymore. I know. It worked. <laughs> it did work. It did. But where the hell is height? Can't you think about anything else? What am I supposed to be thinking about? That shot! 
That shot was impossible, and I did it. I bloody did it. <laughs> <laughs> Three days later, Height lay on his bed thinking. For the first time, an Ulag operation had been a total fiasco. Not only had the bombing failed, but two important, talented members of the organization were now in prison. He'd seen on television the person who was said to be the brains behind the capture of the Japanese terrorists, public prosecutor Steyan Olsen. Had this man really been responsible for their defeat? Height found it hard to believe. Or rather, he was almost certain that it was an outright lie. Could it have been that chief inspector who had also appeared on television? Height had noted the man's name and appearance. Beck. Martin Beck. He reached for the first volume of the telephone directory and leafed through it till he came to the right page. There it was. Martin Beck, chief inspector. Schuppengarten, 8228043. He had a good memory and he recalled walking in that particular street six weeks ago. Hello, Martin Beck speaking. Hello? Hello? How was he going to get out of the country, and when? Well, that's the million dollar question. Christmas is his best chance. Probably. I looked at a map of Sweden last night for hours. So did I. What do you reckon? How do you think Hyde's going to leave the country? Via Oslo, Helsingborg or Malmö. Yep. So, what do we do about it? <clears throat> Bless you. Thanks. Larson, do you, do you think he's still here? I do. I feel absolutely certain. I think so too. I can't stop bloody thinking about him. But you can't be in three places at once. No. So you have to choose. I and mean, which one do you think's the most likely? Well, they've got a mysterious booking on the Copenhagen boat on the night of the 22nd. What sort of boat? I don't know. It's called King Olaf Luxury Style Travel or something. What sort of booking? English bloke, apparently. Roger Blackman. Made me think of Andrew Black. You know, that's the name he used for the car. And police can't trace him. This Roger Blackman, so maybe. I'll take Skaka with me and go to Malmö. Why don't you take Rune? Skaka knows Malmö, he lived there. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot. Melander and Rune will have to go to Helsingborg. Which isn't an easy one. No, they'll need backup, definitely. Do you want Strumgren to go with you to Norway? I wouldn't want to go for a piece with Strumgren. I'll go on my own. Ah, uh, so which of the critical days would you say? 20th to the 23rd. And that means Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Ooh, why not Christmas Eve as well? Yeah, OK, Christmas Eve and all, but it'll go on Sunday. According to you? Yeah, well, it's my intuition. You can't have total monopoly, you know. <laughs> Christ, Melanda's going to be thrilled. About what? Sitting at a freezing cold ferry port for the whole of Christmas. He'll have to put up with it, won't he? OK, is that it then? Is that the plan? Yeah. You know what? What? I'd be careful for the next couple of days. What do you mean? You've been on the TV a lot, on the radio. I might just fancy taking revenge before he buggers off. Do you think so? I do, yeah. Shit. I have regular working hours these days. I know. And the boss who's watching me. I know. So it looks a bit funny when a policeman comes to work and picks me up 45 minutes early. Sorry. It's all right. These are very particular circumstances. Really? I've got to go away tonight. Tonight? To Malma. I should have left this afternoon, but I wanted to see you. Oh, how long will you be gone? Will you be away for Christmas? Maybe. Well, how long have we got? My train leaves at midnight. OK. Shall we go to bed? Yes, please. Height could not see into the bedroom, but when the lights came on again, a woman came to the window. She was naked. He recognised her immediately. He pointed the gun at her heart. If he pulled the trigger, she would be thrown backwards across the room and be dead before her back hit the wall. Why do you have to go to Mama? To look for height. Mr. Sideburns. Yeah. Do you know what I think he's doing at the moment? What? Fishing in Bali. Really? 
Well, I don't know, do I? Will, will you come away from the window? I'm looking at the stars. Uh, come away from the window. What? What's wrong? Uh, I, it's nothing. I, I just remembered something. What? Nothing. Liar. <sighs> Last one scared me. Just told me to be careful. Of what? Of height. Hyde watched as Martin Beck pulled the blinds down. A moment later, Rhea was transforming the lobster in the fridge into something wonderful. And Reinhard Height was walking calmly down Bullhus Alley. He had decided, in the end, that the Swedish policeman was not worth the trouble. In fact, you could hardly believe a man so ordinary looking could prove a real threat. In that moment, as he walked away, he decided how he would leave the country. On Sunday the 22nd of December, the chaos at Malmö Terminal was at its worst. There's so many people. I know, I know. I don't see how he's down a chance. Well, he's pretty tall. Yeah, and that's all we've got going for us. Well, maybe he'll take the Oslo route, give Lars on a chance to punch him. At midday, two boats were due to set sail. Skaka went over to the Danish one, and Beck stood by the Swedish one. The Danish boat cast off first, and Skaka, who'd been waiting by the gangway, headed toward the Swedish one. Martin Beck was standing just behind the man who was clipping tickets when he saw height only two meters away. From much further away, 25 meters at least, Skaka saw height and height saw Skaka. And Skaka's expression gave him away. In that moment, Martin Beck took a step forward and grabbed hold of Height's right arm. Height already had a pistol in his hand, and with all his strength, he raised it towards Skaka. Skaka aimed at Height and fired. Height fell to the ground, and Skaka fell too. Penny! 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 What happened? You killed him. Did I? Did I, did I do the right thing? Absolutely. Oh. Good. That's all right. Yeah. I feel really uh, odd. It's like lie still. What's wrong with me? Before you killed him, he shot you. Really? Yeah. Lie still. Okay. You'll be all right. You'll be fine. Okay. Can I speak to Gunvald Larsson, please? I've got a sec. Thanks. Someone on the phone wants Gunvald Larsson. That one that's dressed like a millionaire. Here it is. Can you go get him? I've got a sec. He'll be here in a sec. Okay. Do you know who this hype bloke is? He's an international terrorist who's killed hundreds of people. Really? Yes, really. Oh, you haven't seen him here, and all the stopping cars and everything. He's creating the longest bloody traffic jam. Oh, oh you're here. Easy. Hang on. I'll pass you over. Oh. Uh, passing you over. Hello. It's me. What's happened? We got him. You got him? Yeah. Alive? No. Sorry. Shit. Sorry. Ah, oh, sod it. At least it's over. Gunvald Larsson suddenly felt that he had not slept for a thousand years. He managed to drive as far as Karlstadt then gave up and stopped at a hotel. And in Helsingborg, Melanda and Rune almost danced with joy. They would, after all, be home in time for Christmas. Friday the 10th of January 1975 was just the kind of evening everyone hopes for more of. The kind of evening when everyone has eaten and drunk well and knows they are free the next day. As long as nothing too horrible or unexpected happens. Martin Beck, Rhea Nielsen, Lennart Colbert, and his wife Gunn were playing a game called Crosswords. Um, X. Again? Yep. That's the same time. Yeah. As in X policeman. Mm. Do you remember ten years ago? Mm. Ten years ago? Yeah, when the police had just been nationalised. Yep. I think that's when the job began to go downhill. I don't. I don't think it was ever any good. Doesn't mean it's not getting worse. It gets worse all the time. Why? What? Why? The letter Y. Ha! 
I won. You did. Congratulations. <laughs> That's five times you've won. <laughs> and Leonard's won four times. Me and Martin haven't won once. He doesn't care, do you? Not really. Mm. Hey. What? Don't sit there thinking about all that now. Shall we play again? Yeah. Sure. You know what the trouble is with you? Me? Yes. You've got the right job at the wrong time, in the wrong country, in the wrong system. Is that all? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's my turn to start, and I say X. You can't say X no. again. I can, and I will. I say X, oh. as in marks. <laughs> In The Terrorists by Mai Huerval and Per Valeur, Martin Beck was played by Stephen McIntosh and Colbert by Neil Pearson. Larson was played by Ralph Ineson, Run by Wayne Foskett and Melanda by Adrian Scarborough. Skaka was played by Sam Alexander, Rea by Nadine Marshall, Crasher, Robert Blythe, Bulldozer Olson, Michael Maloney and Rebecca Lind, Hannah Wood. Height was played by Alex Lane Pecken, The Judge by John Rowe, and Le Valois by David Seddon. Malm was played by Nick Murchie, Mr. Bunderson by Ben Crow, The Police Commissioner by Rick Warden, and Christianson by Don Gillet. The Court Official was played by Matthew Watson, Ruth Salmonson by Philippa Stanton, and Gunn Colbert by Sally Oruk. Other parts were played by Paul Stonehouse and Joanna Brooks. The narrators were Leslie Sharp and Nicholas Gleaves. Original music was by Elizabeth Purnell. The Terrorists was dramatised for radio by Katie Hims, and the director was Mary Pete.